Emma Story Gordon, welcome to the show. How are you today? I am very well. Thank you so much for having me. We were just chatting before we started about um, that I felt really rude because I was like, I have to eat something before I come on, but I wanted to show up at my best. And I knew Hungry Emma wouldn't have great chat. So now I'm here with great chat. Exactly. I can attest to that already. And I appreciate you feeding yourself before coming on. I've had a couple of conversations with other people and they're like, I can't do a podcast like after 2 or 3 p.m. because you're going to get nothing out of me. So I think that everyone has their like, I know that I'm cognitively sharp in these times and outside of this, you, there's not even a bother in talking to me. I think that's so true. Or if you know that you've got like three or four things that you have to be on for that day, whether it's a podcast or a live or a conversation with someone or checking with a client or something, I know I'm not good after like three things in a row. And actually, I was that's one of the reasons that I wasn't that good as a face to face coach is I was like, I, I can't do more than three clients back to back and show up at my best. Like I'm drained after that. I don't know if it's like an introvert thing. It could be. I, I was going to say, I can't um, relate from an extrovert perspective, but I felt the same. Like after three, I would need like a good hour and a half to go regain my energy before coming back into them. Because I think when I used to do mine, I would do the, you probably did the same, like six till 9 a.m. in the morning or 6.30 till 9.30. And then I would like, I don't want to get another one in until like 11.30. So I've had a couple of hours to just like decompress and then I'll come back into it. So yeah, I would break them up and then have maybe my training later in the day as well. But then, like you said, when you've done like five sessions, you train and you've had to recover your energy, you're like dead by five, 6 p.m. sessions, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I like, I respect people that are like, Do you know what, my energy is best at this time. Let's book in at this time. Yeah, I, that's what I kind of the approach I've taken with coaching now is that I'll do the vast majority of my work like very very early I would love to be the person who like do something for you first thing in the morning I'm like if I do something for me I'm not going to be able to do anything else for the rest of the day so I find that yeah talking and doing creative work in the evening I can do but when it comes to like cognitive bandwidth I find that I taper as the day goes on do you find the same yeah I find the same I, I I'm interested as to how much of that is partly the stress that you put on yourself or like I know that I'm much better at kind of relaxing and sitting down into a conversation if I know that I've got what I need to do done already like if we if this was as context this is like 1 30 p.m here so I've already done like the work that I really needed to do today and now I'm like okay this is great I'm gonna really enjoy this conversation whereas if you'd asked me to get up at I don't know 8 a.m and do this I really wouldn't want to do that. Like, I really like that first chunk of my day to be like, get my head in the zone a little bit and tick off things that I need to get done. And then I can relax a little bit more. Mm. It's really interesting how people have different flows and there is different ability. Oh, sorry. Just my Siri just came on. I <laughs> just, just saying it's, it's interesting how yeah, everyone has different flows and different ways of working. And it's ironic that everyone's now working this out now because they've had the opportunity to work from home. Whereas most of it was like, you show up at nine, you leave at five, you do as much as you can within that time frame, And if you can't, then sorry, not sorry. But it's great that people have the opportunity to do that. And we've been able to recognize that as well. But don't you think it was so strange? Like I remember at uni learning about concentration span and kind of like bits of psychology and stuff. And them saying, you know, we know that people can't concentrate for more than like 15 minutes in a go or something. Or like when we talk about, um, deep work and things like we know that people can't do that for a prolonged period of time and then they're like great so we've got a two-hour lecture block what like it, you literally teaching me in the lecture that there's no way I can concentrate for this full period of time it's so strange and we in work it's the same right like if you've got a nine to five or something like people know that if you give people a break or if you give them the opportunity to get outside and do some exercise or clear their head they will work better like they will be more productive and yet we still don't implement that. And we know that like, if you give people more autonomy, especially high performers, if you give them more autonomy of, do you know what? If you get this work done, like this is what needs to be done. I want it to the best of your ability. You get that done, do it however you want. Like you can take a break here, you can take a break there, you can do whatever, get the work done. And and I'm going to judge you based on your work out, like the work that you do rather than the hours that it's taken you to do it or exactly how you've done that work. And I think we'd get so much more out of people if we could do that. And I understand not all jobs are conducive to that. But I think given that we like logically know all of that, it's such a strange way that we have people work. To play devil's advocate with that, do you think part of the reason is that you mentioned, especially high performance, do you think that most people just would 
either i think this is probably the perspective that companies have it's like most people will take advantage of it or they just don't have the ability to even structure their own schedule in an optimal fashion and they'll find themselves overwhelmed i think that was part of the issue maybe part of the problem is because that's the way it exists or maybe the part of the issue is people haven't been taught how to do it but when you did take away people's structure when the first lockdown kicked in it was almost like you removed like the jenga block that made the whole <laughs> jenga tower fall down because they're like i know i get to work i can do this because i have this time frame and then all of a sudden everyone had autonomy over their days and they didn't really know what to do with it so maybe that's part of the reason i think you're right on both levels there i think the primary reason everything kind of went to shit for a lot of people for lockdown was that they were used to that structure so used to that structure and like i've had partners in the past that have been in the forces or like friends that have been in the forces and, and when they leave they're like I don't, I don't know what to do because I've been told since when I signed up at 16 what to do for every aspect of my life and it's not that they're incompetent like if anything there's some of the most competent people I know but they don't know how to action that themselves so I think that part of that's a skill and I do think that part of that is potentially a trait and it's very easy from like our perspective of doing something that we love and like probably the extreme end, like if you're an entrepreneur in some form, you have to fuel yourself. Like no one's, no one's telling us to do anything. Like I could do no work for weeks and I'd probably get away with it, but I have no interest in doing that whatsoever. And I do understand that not everyone is wired like that. So I think there's an, there's probably an element of both like, is it nature or is it nurture? And it probably does depend on the job as well. But even if you think of what most people might see, see as like quite mundane jobs, like, I don't know, say you're, stacking shelves or something imagine how much quicker you'd get it done if they're like there's three pallets there you need to stack them when you when you finish doing that you get to go home yeah well you're de-incentivized to do that right because they'll say okay you've done three here's another three because you've got extra time now right exactly and I, I remember working um and I it wasn't even like a particularly mundane job it was working in research but like I had to stay there till 5 p.m and some days it was just like there was literally nothing I could do during those hours because I'd know experiments had finished or something. And I just have to like twiddle my thumbs till five, till 5 PM when you leave. And it's such a waste of time. Like, and I hate, I hate wishing away time. I think that's, you know, it's like the one commodity that we can't buy back. And to just be sitting there wishing it away is just the worst. Yeah, the incentive structure is so backwards because if you are productive, you are literally setting yourself up to either be incredibly bored and non-stimulated or you're setting yourself to do even more work whilst other people across the office are doing half the amount and filling the time. So it's a really interesting structure and it's a funny conversation. And you made a great point on the note of enjoying it as well because I remember transitioning from doing GCSEs when obviously in school you had lessons, you had a timetable to doing A-levels when you had certain lessons, but then you had those free periods in which you would uh, study. And I found that really challenging to then put myself into a position where I would actually use those free lessons to study myself. But now when you look at me today, because I'm doing something I genuinely enjoy, I love structure. I love filling my time with just like back, back to back to back. But in A-levels, I found it really tough without that structure, interestingly enough, and I couldn't do that myself. So I wonder if it is partly because if people don't enjoy what they're doing, they're just like, uh, you know, I'll just get around to it when I want to. And other things probably seem more important or more pressing or interesting as a matter of fact. Do you think it's partly because you can see the benefit of your effort? Or like directly and you're you're getting that benefit as well because I think like I really struggle like I'm quite actually quite a lazy person if I can't see the benefit of doing something like for example like my flat isn't particularly nicely set up because I'm single right I live alone like, and I don't really care about that stuff and like people are always surprised that I eat like quite mundane food if I'm not going out for dinner because I and then it's not got nothing to do with it being like optimal or healthy or within calories. It's just because it's just me. I don't really like I don't care about those things. So there's a there are like elements of my life where I put almost like no effort in. And actually, there's a theory about this. It's called like minimizing and maximizing. And that and I guess the idea is that there are certain oh no wait is it satisfying. So basically, there's certain areas of your life where you just want to satisfy it. Like, I get the food in, I don't care what it looks like, it's not fancy Instagram stuff, whatever. And then there are areas of my life where I want to maximise and optimise. And like, for me, that's work, and that's what I really enjoy doing, and that's what I'm passionate about. But there are certainly other areas where I'm like, I know I need to do this stuff, 
but I don't see a huge benefit from it. So I just do like enough and no more. And I, I think that there's this saying, kind of like entrepreneurial saying, right? You've probably seen it tweeted numerous times and it's like, the way you show up for one thing in your life is the way you show up for everything. You took the words out of my mouth. I was literally about to say how you do one thing is how you do anything or something like that. I, I was going to say how much I hate that. This was literally yeah. the next thing I was going to say. It's the worst saying I've ever heard. Like, if you try and show up 100% for everything that you ever do, well, like, you can't, right? No, you're just, exactly. your, your new 100% will be, like, 50%. It's way better to be, like, those things don't matter to me. These things do. And I think the same is true with, like, spending time, effort, money. Like, money is quite an obvious one, but, like, I don't have a car because I don't care. Like, I don't want, I don't really care about cars. Like, and when I did have a car, it was a really old car, I actually only got rid of it like a couple of years ago and it was the car I learned to drive in, right? And I'm not that young. So it was a really, really old car. And it, like things like that. But whereas I know that other people, I'm certainly not judging other people for being like, I'm going to buy a Jag. Like if you, if you get genuine enjoyment out of that and that's what you love and that's something that you want to like maximize, fine. For me, I'm like, I need to get from A to B. I'm going to satisfy it. But it doesn't bring me much joy. But there might be other areas of my life where I'm like, yeah, I'll spend a lot of money on that because it's important to me. I think that's maybe a good example as well. Yeah, I like that perspective. I've never heard of the uh, kind of satisfaction rule before, but I can massively resonate. I'm incredibly lazy outside of work as well. I, I don't really like doing that much. Like once I'm done, I'm done and that's it. And if I'm asked to do everything, so I'm like, can I outsource my cleaning? Because I don't want to clean. You know, I want a clean house. I want the outcome, but I don't want the process of that. But when it comes to work, like you said, if you can see that return on investment and you know that it's directly contributing towards something that you want to do and want to achieve, and then it totally makes sense. But yeah, I can massively resonate with that. And I, I can't stand that quote. It's, it's everywhere. And so many people used to say it to me. I'm like, why would you want to wash your dishes 110%? Why would you want to fold every single sock in your drawer or, put, you know, or your underwear and then miss out on all the energy that you could be putting into things that genuinely matter? It never made sense to me. Yeah, and then you outsource the stuff that other people want to do 100%, like a cleaner will clean 100% because that's what they're good at. And I think that that's probably underrated from, like I mentor a lot of personal trainers as well. And one of the first things I tell them to outsource is their cleaning, unless they're someone who, you know, some people weirdos, but some people like cleaning. They're like, I get a lot of stress release from this. Like, I challenge this. I, I'm not sure they do. I really don't think they do. I'm like, so you, so you prefer cleaning over going and getting like a one hour massage. Is that right? And then once you actually put it into that perspective, they're like, oh, this is my outlet. This is my stress releasing. I'm like, maybe you're just not releasing your stress in a more, you know, a, a more effective way. I think people just think it is because that's the only outlet they go to, but they could actually choose something that they enjoyed far more than cleaning. I'm sure. Uh, I don't fully disagree, but I have met people or like lived with people who do genuinely like tra uh, cleaning. And I think part of it is they see the outcome as well. Yeah, that's so it's fair. Like, it's something to tick off. It's something that's like relatively mundane, but they feel productive doing it. So there's like kind of more elements to it than that. But anyway, if you're not that person and you're looking to say expand your business before you even think about getting like a virtual assistant or something, what what is it in your life? that you can that you're doing that's wasting time and effort and and like stuff that you could be putting into your business like if it means that I can have one more client by paying a cleaner to clean instead of the hour that I normally spend doing it that makes absolute sense to me and I don't enjoy doing it and I do enjoy coaching and I'm way better at coaching than I am cleaning so that makes a hell of a lot of sense and actually a cleaner is probably cheaper than a good VA and also you takes a hell of a lot less training right if you want to work with someone you need to train them up to do what you want them to do you don't need to train up your cleaner no exactly and if you're employed you kind of already know your hourly rate but if you're self-employed then you've kind of got to place it on yourself but generally obviously the more advanced you get the more clients let's say you know a client is paying you x amount per hour the amount you pay a cleaner per hour is not going to be nearly close to that probably so you're actually technically making money by spending time on your business versus spending time cleaning the house but I actually will counter my point because if someone said I want to do all the cooking for you now part of me would be super happy but when I get to cook at the end of the day after you know just to disconnect for 15 minutes and do something pretty mundane listen to music or a podcast I actually quite like that but for two hours I don't think I would <laughs> 
Yeah, I agree with that. And I think that you can get, you can go too far with anything, right? You can try and streamline everything and be like, well, then I could work for another hour. And then you forget that, oh, wait, you know, doing, it doesn't matter how much you've outsourced. Like, there's only so much energy that you have to give. And like, you can't just do, just because you have another hour, it doesn't mean you can do another good podcast. It doesn't mean you can show up at your best again. So you need that time off to recharge. And if, like cleaning is a way that you recharge or if cooking is a way that you recharge then that has its use as well Mm. and maybe part of it and I haven't worked this part out yet is that if I do outsource to a cleaner and I would feel like okay if I'm paying this cleaner then either I could be cleaner or I could be working and I can't actually put relaxing in that time but maybe that's the key right because then you are going to re-energize yourself so you are more productive in those hours so I think there might be a part feeling that most people have of guilt in that time like oh you know i could be doing that and i'm paying someone to do it and i i think maybe that's related to it yeah definitely that's why you have to leave while they're there <laughs> yeah, exactly you can't just be there with them cleaning around you like, oh, no, no. amazing well i love that conversation already but i want to transition onto the theme of today because a lot of people will know you for your tweets your instagram posts the content that you put out the endless content you put out absolutely everywhere as well um and what i did is i did dig through the archives and i did a lot of uh, scrolling through to find 10 of some of my favorite posts that you've put together and i essentially want us to go through them and i want you to expand on them so we can add the nuance to them some of them are a little bit self-explanatory but i feel like it's worth the conversation just to broaden the horizons on those uh, perspectives a little bit let's do it i'm very impressed as well <laughs> it was quite enjoyable to be completely honest it's what I quite like when I research guests I like going back to like you know let's say as basically not as far back as their Instagram will go because that would have been really hard for yours for example but as far as I can get without blowing my mind too much in terms of like okay I'm exhausted now and seeing their progression I find that really fascinating to just see what were they talking about then how they changed their position on things and it was interesting to see that in yourself as well and uh, although I think that the fundamentals have st- stood the test of time and I think you're going to see that in the, some of the tweets that I picked out today so I will start with the first one which is a uh, one that I think we need to go into because the people will jump to these extremes you don't need to go vegan to eat less meat <laughs> Oh, see, I like this one. I think this was after a podcast I did with one of my good friends and clients who is called Dr. Hannah Ritchie, and she's done a hell of a lot of research. In fact, her PhD was on the impact of diet on the environment or like on your carbon footprint. And looking at a lot of that data and some of the, like, if anyone wants to see this data, it's all on our world and data and has like incredible graphs. And if you're a visual person, like I love a graph. Um, it's definitely worth looking at because you see the huge impact that like red meat has and then the relatively small impact or yeah relatively I'll emphasize that like other forms of meat or dairy or like eggs and things have and I I think that you know it's going to become a really important thing but at the moment what I see is that you know there's a camp who are vegan and care about the environment and then there's everyone else And actually what would make by far the biggest impact is people just eating a little bit less meat, especially red meat. If we all did that, that's going to have such a big impact. Whereas if, you know, 0.01% of the population go extreme and go vegan, it has absolutely like basically no impact whatsoever. And I think people are put off because they're like, no, yeah, I do care about the environmental cost of my diet, but I'm not, I don't care enough to go fully vegan or that seems like very extreme and I don't want to do that. So I'll just do nothing. And not realizing that actually, you know, that middle ground of just, so do you know what? I'm going to consciously only have steak once a month instead of what I normally do, which is have it every week. Or like, I'm going to consciously reduce the amount of meat I'm eating in a week. I'm going to have a, maybe only one meal a day that has meat in, in comparison to having it for every meal or something. Like those changes, if we all made small changes would have such a big impact. And it's the same is true with like most things like recycling. If we all recycled a little bit more, we didn't have to like recycle every single thing that we ever touch. But if we all just did a little bit more, we'd have a huge impact. So yeah, that was the context behind that one. I like that. And if you said to me, it's either go vegan or stay eating meat, I wouldn't go vegan. It's just not going to happen. But if you said you can reduce down your meat consumption, I'd be like, 
I can do that. You know, I, I, I could quite comfortably do that. And it's just a much more practical thing. I think maybe, I know it's hard to say, I think it's skewed because the vegans are usually the loudest, but let's say that's 10 to 20% of the population who have the likelihood of going vegan, for example. The 80% else, if you just, yeah, they're probably never going to go fully vegan, but if you told them to just cut down a little bit, I think at least 50 to 60, even not 70% would take that on board. And that would probably make much more of a contribution than trying to get that 80% to go vegan when you probably have a 10% a return on investment by guilting people into it, by making them feel terrible and animal killers and all those type of environment is destroyers, you know, and all the narratives that come out of it. It's very similar to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume that this is in the top 10, but the kind of black and white thing, or like perfectionist mindset of, you know, like if I, I'll either do it perfectly and be a vegan or I'll not do it at all. And actually you get the biggest bang for your buck in the middle ground. And the same is true with like exercise, right? It's either I'll go to the gym every single day or I'll not go at all. And actually, if you can, you know, even one hour of exercise a week has these huge, huge health benefits. Or And, and I guess on a smaller scale, it's like I'll, I'll either go to the gym and do a full hour or I'm not going to go at all. It's like, do you know what? 15 minutes at home has a huge benefit to you. So it's always worth doing something and actually... When you understand like the law of diminishing returns in relation to your effort, you realize that it's the first bit of effort that has the biggest outcome, right? So being like, for example, 70% vegan is going to have a far bigger impact than like that little 30% more, which probably adds like, you know, 1%. Yeah. And to add to that as well, it's like, just go for high qu- higher quality meat as well, right? Like you, you can just get it sourced locally, which would make a big difference. And I... I don't know if they had the data when the, with the place that you mentioned in terms of the graph, but did they look into the environmental impact of importing all of the fruit and veg from all these other countries that we get them from as well? Because I'd be intrigued on that because if most people would be much better off not relying on that because of it's not hard to get, you, know, you can't grow blueberries in the UK, for example, um, and just get meat locally. And that'd probably be a better approach. Yeah, okay. like it depends why you're going vegan and we could go into this, but it's actually quite surprising. So for example, flying over avocado from wherever, Mexico or something, is hugely costly in comparison to actually eating meat from down the road in terms of its carbon footprint. And it's not always quite like clear because it's not necessarily how far it's come, it's how it's come. So if it's air travel, it has a huge carbon footprint. If it's on like a shipping container, it might actually be worth, you know, be more carbon neutral or low carbon footprint to get it from the other side of the world on a ship than it is to get it locally, depending on how it's been grown. The other thing that really surprised me was that like, when you think about it, not surprising, but a lot of people are so like pro-organic and that comes to come with like, tends to come with veganism as well. But actually that has a much bigger carbon footprint because of the way that things have to be grown. And actually there's such a high cost to growing things organically in comparison to growing things not organically. You've got the best of the best there, the organic vegan. That's the maximum virtual signal that you could possibly (laughs) see. Number two, which is there's more to life than dieting. Agreed. But you can have a very full life whilst you lose body fat. Yes, I think this is another, like, so common in the fitness industry, but false dichotomy, right? A lot of people are like, there's more to life than dieting, so I'm just going to stay overweight. But, well, also, like, there, I mean, it that has consequences as well. So, it, you know, it's all fun and games when you don't yet have diabetes or you haven't had some of the ill consequences that come with not looking after your health. But... I think that we often create this like, oh, well, I may as well, I don't know, live my life now as if you can't live your life while losing a little bit of body fat. And I I think it probably comes from how most people approach diets, right? With this all or nothing mentality, with this dieting is horrible. It's going to be really low calories. I'm not going to be able to go out with my friends. I'm not going to be able to eat the foods I enjoy. All these like expectations. And essentially what's happening is people think that they have to put their life on hold in order to get the body fat that they want or you know in order to diet and I think that's something that we really need to work against is that you can live like I'm always saying to my clients like I want you to live your best life while losing body fat 
And the reason that people struggle with dieting is approaching it with that mentality and then thinking that they need to be patient. And I speak about patience a lot, but I actually have almost like changed my narrative on this where I would rather say to someone now, like you don't need to be patient because you're not putting your life on hold. Like everyone's like, oh, be patient with the scales, be patient with this, be pa-. don't be patient with anything. Just do the shit you want to do now. Doesn't matter if you've got five pounds extra body fat, like wear the bikini now. Don't put your life on hold expecting it's going to be completely different when you weigh X on the scales. That's a big problem. So yeah, that's kind of what that means. But I think that a lot of the time people say stuff like that, almost like virtue signaling, you will have seen in our industry for sure. Like guys, don't worry about calories. Like um, there's more to life than losing body fat. And it's like, of course there's more to life than losing body fat. It's a stupid thing to say, but it doesn't mean that you can't live your life and lose body fat. It's two sets of people. It's either the person who's spent the last 10 years on the bodybuilding stage or dieting extremely, got their head right in it. And now they're going into the opposite spectrum thinking that everyone's had that same experience that they've had, but they've literally not. Or the people who are overweight potentially and dieting just didn't work for them. They didn't find the approach that worked. So they're like, you know what? This didn't work for me. So I'm just going to accept what is. And those are the two people who spout that narrative, unfortunately. But you're absolutely right in the sense of, yes, you know, patience is great in some ways. But I, I recently heard a quote saying, be patient with the result, but impatient with your actions, which I really like, right? It's like, there's no reason why you can't proactively really try and work something, but you can't really always control the outcome. So like you said, you may as well wear that bikini now and see how you feel, because you probably feel better than you expected. Yeah. Yeah, and I think we do build this, like a lot of the times we attribute other problems to the fact that we have a little bit more body fat like that might not be the reason that you're not confident that might not be the reason that you're delaying applying for a job or delaying dating someone or any of these things and sometimes we build this up that oh you know I'll, it's almost like a reason not to do something and actually realizing that you don't have to put your life on hold for that and you probably won't feel any different five pounds lighter no, you probably feel worse, to be honest. <laughs> Both of the time, that, those extra five pounds are the, the ones that actually make you suffer the most. But this is, interestingly enough, this transitions onto the next one. Your last few pounds will be twice as hard as your first few pounds. It will take you at least twice the effort, as twice as long, and require at least twice the effort. And you need to decide whether it's worth it or not. So this one is like, it, it might seem quite obvious to, to people, but often until you point it out, they can't quite see it. So it might, you might have someone who's lost a load of weight really quickly or relatively quickly and then can't understand why it's taking longer and longer to lose the last little bit and part of it's because if you think about how much body fat you have to lose and really you know as much as people like you know maybe a pound a week is quite realistic and it's not that bad a target to go off it's not going to be linear but something roughly like that but actually it's usually a percentage of the total body fat that you have to lose that you're losing as opposed to a pound a week. So the less body fat you have, the harder it is to continue to lose that at the same rate. So that rate is going to slow down. And also the more your body pushes back, so you'll be hungrier, you'll probably move less. You might need to drop your calories because you're now a smaller person, which requires less calories to maintain. So there's all these elements. And I think there comes a point where the effort is no longer worth the reward. So for example, your first five pounds that you lost might have been a complete no brainer. Might be like, yeah, the effort I put in to lose that was 100% worth the reward. But at some point, not only will it not become logical to lose any more body fat, but you'll also find that this point is different for everyone. So a question I get all the time from clients is like, how do I know when to stop dieting, when to stop losing body fat. And part of that's physiological, right? Part of that's, we want you in a healthy BMI range. Like we don't want you going too low. We don't want you being too high, like somewhere in that healthy range, but that range is quite large. And that means that for every individual, it's gonna look slightly different. And really, I think the fundamental of knowing when to stop losing body fat is, does the effort now outweigh the benefit? Like is it costing you more in effort than what you're getting in benefit from that? And that that will look slightly different for everyone, depending on their values, depending on their lifestyle, et cetera, et cetera. But what I tend to find is that people who are pushing towards that last, last five pounds or last whatever, and they can't ever get there, 
it's usually because they don't want it enough and that's absolutely fine. I think some people have, uh, probably because they've seen personal trainers be like, you just don't want it enough as if you should want it more. But actually it's the free, like the free, the most freeing thing in the world to be like, I don't want it enough. Like I don't want it that much. So I'm going to give up on that goal. And there's a quote and it's like, nothing, nothing is as heavy as like an unfulfilled goal. But it, especially if it's like an unfulfilled goal that you don't really want. So giving up on that, stop putting this huge amount of pressure on yourself, usually to reach this arbitrary scale weight that actually means nothing. But you had in your head at the end of your diet, you'd weigh 65 kilograms. And now you're 68 like you know really pushing yourself to get to 65 for absolutely no reason accepting that and being like oh okay I'm, I feel good here I look good I'm happy I didn't reach that random scale weight that I set myself but at this point like the effort to lose more body fat isn't worth it for me anymore and that feels really good like it feels good to get to that place and it's certainly not giving up it's just like it's sensible to be like there's no need for me to more effort into that yeah i couldn't agree more and i remember working with a client recently and um it was maybe a year ago now actually and she mentioned that she wanted to get to this it was literally like the difference between like 52 and 50 kilos or something like that very very similar and she kept going at it and kept going at it and there was a point in which we were just like okay we need to reflect on this what why are you not doing this because your actions are kind of speaking louder than your words here and then she kind of reflected on it and she had the introspection and the self-awareness to do this and she realized it was another coach she worked with in the past said that she would be like photo shoot ready or lean at this weight. And it just stuck with her for so long. And before she realized, she's like, you know, my actions have been telling me all along. I'm very happy with what I've achieved. I've still lost like 10 kilos. And that's the frustrating part is that people lose sight of how much they actually did. They lose sight of the 90% because they didn't fulfill the 10% of this, like you said, arbitrary number that actually doesn't mean that much. So it's a really interesting perspective to have. One question I do have off the back of that is how do you stop people from stopping too early and going too easy on themselves? Because I'm sure that's a easy temptation and trap to fall into. Mm, good question. I think generally knowing people's like getting people to set values and then goals based on those values is so, so important because then you've got an overarching like, why am I doing this and why is it important to me? And that, like, you know, an easy example of this is I want to lose body fat for my health. So my health would be the overarching value. And at the moment, the goal is body fat loss to, to be healthier. Now, once you're in like a healthy BMI range, losing more body fat doesn't really make any sense to improve your health. In fact, at some point it will be detrimental to your health. So it kind of keeps you in that range by making sure that there's an overarching value. Um, and I really liked what you were saying about the scale weight. And I see this quite a lot. And a client once told me this story and I thought it was such a good like analogy for, I guess, measuring success in really arbitrary ways that don't actually matter. So her story was about how she she had a puppy and she took it to puppy training classes and these were like every week for 12 weeks or something and at the end you know there was like a little puppy graduation which sounds very exciting like, I would like to be involved in that but anyway like they have to do I don't know whatever it is like fit, recall blah 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 they have to pass a test and then they get this certificate that says like you've passed puppy training and she was really happy with the puppy. She's like, does everything I want it to at home now. Like it doesn't pee in the house. Like it does, you know, it does sit. Like it's good with the kids, blah, blah, blah. Like really happy. But it failed the test. Like it failed the test. Now, now you have to, when you take a step back, you're like, did I go to 12 weeks of puppy training classes to get a piece of paper? Or did I go to 12 weeks of puppy training classes to get a well-trained dog? Now I have a well-trained dog. And it just makes it so obvious. And the same is true with fat loss. It's like, did I do this, you know, 12 weeks of a program or something to weigh X on the scales? Or did I do it to look, feel and perform my best? Now I know that I'm looking and feeling and performing my best, but I didn't reach this random scale weight. And then you feel disappointed by that. And it, it just like, is such a good perspective of being like that had nothing to do with the success that I came for and people always want these tangible markers which I I, I get but having that like insight and perspective to be like okay yeah I achieved everything that I actually wanted to achieve I just didn't get the piece of paper 
That's perfect. I love that. I'm not even going to add to it. I think that's spot on. I'm going to use the puppy analogy in the future now. It's good, isn't it? <laughs> It is. So this one's probably going to blow a lot of people's minds because when I first discovered this, and I'm sure it was the same with yours um, when you actually worked this out. I was today years old when I found out that most BCAAs on the market are made from human hair, pig skin, or duck feathers. Oh, <laughs> Outrageous. Because I was like, surely that's not true. I think I'm sure one of my clients sent me something and was like, is this true? And I was like, Haha, no. And then I was like, oh my God, <laughs> it actually is. Um, I mean, there are so many levels to this. One, if anyone's listening and taking BCAAs, absolute waste of money. Um, and two, yeah, that's really gross. But, I mean, those are the levels, really. But yeah, there's, there's no need to be taking BCAAs. I still can't believe that some people are promoting them or still taking them. Like, I can't understand it. Do you um, think the same with EAAs? And do you know if they're made out of the same thing? I don't know if they're made out of the same thing, but a part of me just assumes that they probably would be. Uh, I Broadly, I do think the same. Like, if you can take essential amino acids, you can drink a protein shake. Um, the, only, the only situation where I think that might be applicable is in maybe, like, vegans who are really struggling to get in enough protein or, more to the point, enough high-quality protein that's going to you know, that leucine threshold and provide all the essential amino acids. I could see it in that. And even still, like I have a lot of vegan clients despite the start of the podcast. And <laughs> likewise, <laughs> uh, and, and we don't like, we don't use essential amino acids. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't bother, but I think like I do have conversations with people who, who are like, yeah, but if I could just get my essential amino acids, I'm like, just drink some protein. And they're like, oh, but, but uh, wouldn't it be better? No, it wouldn't be better. Like, and I think part of the reason for this comes from that if, if, uh, and I think this is right anyway, if it's not a full macro, so for example, you can get away with putting on the front of uh, essential amino acids that they have no calories in them because the way that calories are equated on, um, like information about nutrition, it, or like on the back of labels and things is, right, you've got X grams of protein at four calories per gram, that's X calories. Now, if you only have a part of protein, you don't have to put how many calories are in it. There's still calories in it. I think most BCAAs are about 50 calories for a serving. I, and I'm assuming essentially- I would assume so, more. yeah. So then you think, well, you know, if I can get, if you wanna have a really gross protein shake, you could have it for 100 calories, you know, 20 grams of protein times four, 100 calories, bam, uh, if you're making it with water. But it seemed, I mean, that would be better than having essential amino acids, which I don't know, maybe they're 80 calories, you know, like 20 calories. So, yeah. So I think part of the reason people are like attracted to them is because they're like, oh, there's no calories in this. I'm like, no, there is. <laughs> there is. <laughs> yeah. They just didn't have to put it on the label. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. So I'm going to try and get to two to three more. Let's have a look. I've got this one. Self-doubt, lack of confidence, and limiting beliefs are often stories we tell ourselves to justify staying where we are. Oh, God, that was a bit much for me, wasn't it? it was, yeah, it was uh, a ballsy one, that one. <laughs> Self-doubt. Yeah, I do. I actually I still agree with this. I think another one is fear of failure or telling yourself that you self-sabotage. Like all of those, I think a lot of the time, some of the time I'm like, it's not self-sabotage. Like it is in the sense that you've done something that's not conducive to your goal. But I think the this kind of psychological definition or the psychological use of self-sabotage is purposely sabotaging yourself so you don't reach your goal. And there are situations where that might happen. And we kind of touched on this with, if, if say I'm like, I'll apply for that job and I'll go on dates when I fit in a size 10 dress and then I get really close to fitting in that size 10 dress and I'm like, I still don't want to go on dates and I still don't want to apply for that job and I didn't feel the way I thought I would at that size, you can then self-sabotage to be like, well, you know, I'm not there yet so that's why I don't have to do all these other things that I said I was going to do when I reached that point. That can happen. But I think most of the time it's not happening. I don't think that's often what's happening. I think what's usually happening is people lack 
the and I guess like coming back to patients but like the patients required to actually get those results so rather than that they're just bored like they're bored of doing the plan that they're doing and they thought that they were going to get results quicker and they don't want to stick to it and they call it self-sabotage but it's not like I mean it is in the sense that you're not going to get results if you don't stick to the plan so essentially you're in your own way there but it's not in the sense that I'm purposefully self-sabotaging kind of the explanation I just gave. I agree. And what I think is that a lot of people don't realize that they will stay in a paradoxically uncomfortable comfort zone because it feels safer. It feels more secure and more familiar than going out into the uncomfortable in the moment, but the long-term place of where they want to be. And I think that we don't realize that we will literally stay in a terrible position because it's familiar and it's safe. And there's maybe a lot of trauma and deeper stuff attached to that versus venturing into the new, which is going to be far, far better. But like you mentioned, then they put labels on like, oh, I'm self-sabotage. Oh, I never do this. Oh, I do. You know, I'm this type of person just to justify. Actually, I just want to stay in my comfort zone because it's really scary to face what's on the other side of that. That's my perspective anyway. Oh, I completely agree. And I think people forget that there's an opportunity cost to staying where you are. As in like... you're so right that people just say whether they are because it's known discomfort, even if it is uncomfortable, it's known discomfort and that's familiar. And actually something new is a little bit scary, but there's so much more exciting. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, by not saying that I'm going to get to this dress size and then start dating, like, yeah, when you have to get that dress size, but now you have to communicate with that person. Now you have to put yourself out there. Now you have to open yourself up for rejection, meeting people. You might meet the Tinder swindler, for example. Like, you have to then open yourself up to do that. Whereas if I don't reach that goal, I'm quite safe at home. I don't have to be exposed. I don't have to be rejected. Even though I, it's not ultimately what I want, it's it's far more comfortable. So I think, yeah, I think that's probably what a lot of people um, put over the surface, but that's probably the reality of it. So next one is journaling. Oh, there you go. Um, do you think that a lot of people will put up or a lot of people think about fear of failure way too much and not fear of staying where they are like I'm more scared of staying where I am than I am of trying something and failing and I think that perspective is like will change your life like as cheesy as that seems like actually the fear of staying where you are should be much higher than the fear of trying something and it not working out because worst case scenario you'll learn something and it might open some door but like worst case scenario staying where you are if you're not happy where you are why are you worried about trying something and it not working like is it actually going to be worse than where you already are probably not but I think you're right like people are so comfortable in their comfort zone and it's scary to try something new if I'm honest I'm not scared of many things in life, but that's the most horrifying thought that I could possibly think of is just being, you know, 20, yeah, being like 20, 30 years down the line, not taking the risk, being kind of this, like, I almost like to think that there is a, again, this is, I don't want people to take this out of context, but I like to think there is like this version of me who is like the ultimate version of Elliot, right? And the idea is that hopefully someday we're going to cross paths because I'm going to work towards being that person. And the thing that I think is just terrifying is getting to the end of my life, for example, and seeing the person who I could have been and still being like where I currently am. And I think it's a kind of a false dichotomy in the sense of it's like, in trying to complete the gym you're never going to get there but the pursuit of trying to always get stronger always get better you're never going to complete the ultimate goal but the process of it is going to take you very very far so i think it's that same context but yeah just the idea that there's just this significantly better version of me and the reason i didn't reach it was because i didn't take those risks or i stayed in my comfort zone it's just yeah that, that those are the type of things that keep me up at night <laughs> that, that's, it's like you should be more scared of regret than you are of failing and, and I really mm. like, the, was it, it's Jeff Bezos, isn't it? Who is regret minimization, like is his theory. And the whole theory behind that is that if you're making a big choice, you need to ask yourself, would I regret not trying this, even if it doesn't work out? So for example, when he was starting Amazon, it was like that, that could have been a huge failure. He had a very good job beforehand. And he had to leave that very good job to try something new, which was, you know, like, now at hindsight bias you're like oh what a great decision but you have to commit to that decision whether it works out or not 
And this is something that I've been thinking about a little bit recently, that we judge decisions so much on whether they work out or not. Uh, and then we're like, oh, if it worked out, it was a good decision. If it didn't, it was a bad decision. And that's not true. Like in the slightest, like if you drink drive, for example, and you don't kill anyone and you get home safe, still a really bad decision. Like it's still a bad decision. And I would say that like the only reason I would say that Jeff Bezos's decision was a good decision is he used that regret minimization. So he was like, even if this doesn't work, I'll be glad that I tried. And I think as soon as you accept that and you're like, yeah, like no matter what way this goes, I'm, I'm happy that I made this decision and I'm not letting life happen to me. I'm making a conscious decision. And then I can't look back and regret it because I knew that this might not work. And that's like a big, that's a big change, I think. Yeah, I think that's a big one. Because a lot of people be like, but it's going to take five or 10 years. And I'm like, well, you're still going to be five or 10 years older anyway, but you just didn't do what you wanted to do. So yeah, I couldn't agree more on that front. I'm trying to pick out my last one. I think we've got time for one more. So I'm going to go for this one. Real self-care is not bars of chocolate on the sofa or spa days. This is another sassy one from you. It's doing the hard work to create a life that you don't feel the need to regularly escape from. Gosh, that was a bit sassy, wasn't it? I think I got a little bit of shit for that. <laughs> uh, but I stand by it. Um... Yeah, I think so much. So many people use self care as like a reason to not do hard things or to overeat, and it, sometimes the opposite of self care, right? You're looking for that immediate satisfaction, and usually the immediate satisfaction is like delaying pain a lot of the time. So if you look at it from like, let's say you had a breakup, right? Horrible situation. You want to make yourself feel better, and most people will be like have do some self-care right and sometimes that you know be nice to yourself overeat on chocolate overeat on ice cream like sit on the couch all day you're just delaying the pain like for sure like it's nice for that period of time that you're eating then after it you probably feel worse but it certainly hasn't been a long-term solution and the same is true with like numbing your emotion with alcohol like yeah for that period of time while you're drunk you probably forget what you were worried about and it feels quite good. And then in the hangover, you feel even worse. And actually, if you do that consistently, you know, you get into a really dark place or you get into a really bad place. And I'm not saying never, you know, enjoy some chocolate or never like have some ice cream when you've had a breakup. But don't don't always use that as like the only tool. And actually at some point you have to be like, the best thing I can do for myself, the most self-care I can give myself is to get myself off this couch, go for a walk, I don't know, get to the gym or fuel my body with good, healthy, nutritious food. Because that's what my future self is going to be thankful for. Not that I wallowed for weeks and weeks on the couch with ice cream about my ex-partner. Like that's what they're going to be thankful for. And, and a lot of the time you have to do that stuff before you feel like doing it. Like you probably won't feel like going to the gym. And, and th those are the most important times to go. Beautiful message. A couple of final questions. When is your Sunday Times best-selling book coming out? <laughs> well, now that you've collated my top 10, uh, I can... <laughs> I, I, can I was going to say, I think I've got a title name for you. I think I've got like the 50 ESG commandments. I think that's like, you've got to do like a Robert Greene style book. I think that's going to happen. Yeah, I'd quite like that because I, I struggle to structure things. So like 10 points, that would be great. Um, I have actually been approached by a publisher, but I don't know. At the moment, I don't have the bandwidth and it's something that I'd really want to do really well. So one day, yes. Beautiful. I was, I was hoping that would be the case. And where can people find you if they want to hear more about the work that you do and get into your world from a coaching perspective, whether they've got a business or anything like that? Uh, the best sort of hub, I have numerous businesses, but is at ESG Fitness on Instagram or esgfitness.co.uk. And yeah, I'd love to hear from anyone if they've enjoyed the podcast. Amazing. Hopefully we'll bring you on for round two in the future as well and go through like six or seven more of those. Yeah, let's do it. Let's, let's actually do it. We can book after this. Amazing. Thank you so much, Emma. Take care.